In this next stage, we're going to look at moving on from having your baseline information to creating multi-temporal data sets. Okay, so it's key that you get the baseline stuff right first and then looking at how we build that in to understand what happens over a series of dates, uh, of minimum two dates, but potentially longer time, um, longer time intervals than that as well. Okay, so this is really where we're wanting to look at how features change over time. So it might be changing from one type of feature to something else or it might be looking at the transition in between that as well. And what we also want to look at is measuring the magnitude of those changes. Okay, so it might not just be this was, um, was forest and now is cleared, but looking at the quantitative values that happen within that period of time that things change. Okay, so it can be looking at vegetation, it might be looking at water, water quality, water temperature, whatever you like. So most things are changing over some scale of time and it's just whether or not we can pick that up and what the processes are for that. There might be a classification or it could be a quantitative product as well. So there's a number of considerations that we need to take into account before we go into multi-temporal image processing. Okay, and so we break those down into um, geometric, radiometric, and spectral, spectral and temporal. Okay, so that it's, it's really all about those same things that we're talking about with our, our sensor dimensions, so spatial, spectral, radiometric, and temporal, but breaking that down into, the, into the, the quality that they put on your imagery. So in our geometric considerations, the key thing really is what we need to make sure is that the data that we have actually overlap each other, okay, so that there is some registration consistency, so that if we look at one pixel on date one and look at what we think is that same pixel on date two and say it's a change, that that actually does represent change and that it's not just that the image has shifted, okay. So that's all about making sure that we have the correct um, datum coordinate system and that our images are registered correctly as well, yes. So spectral considerations, and again this, this does touch back on what we looked at a few weeks ago in the, in the student's choice, how you actually deal with looking at different sensors and their, their overlapping spectral bands or non-overlapping spectral bands if you like. Um, so this one, this graph here is, is plotting spot versus aster for example. And so both spot and aster don't have a blue band, so they've just got the green, red, um, and near infrared, and then they've both got a range of um, sphere bands as well. But even as you, you can see within the blue range, that response is different, so they've got different sensitivities. The green, pretty similar, and you probably get very similar values in terms of your spectral response of a feature on the ground there. Um, but that near infrared is quite different as well. Okay, so there are variations there and it's more something that you need to be aware of rather than something you can actually correct for in your data set when you don't have hyperspectral data. So radiometric corrections um, is, an, is another consideration that we have to go through um, and we don't actually do it in this class and we talk about it more in the advanced class but this is all about making sure that the value that's in your pixel if it changes over time, that it is attributable to real change, okay? And it's understanding what those variations are going to be based on, based on the sensor characteristics as well, okay? So there will be a shift in radiometry of the sensors um, and that will affect the response that you see within individual pixels, okay? So this is all about that brightness value that you get back within, um, within specific wavelengths, okay? This is probably one of the easier ones to calibrate for, okay, because it's all about just building a model of, of pixels in, in areas that you know definitely haven't changed, so deep water for example, um, and some bright areas, um, some infrastructure, and, and create a, creating a model for that correction. So our main temporal considerations is really all about what's happening on the ground at the time when we capture those images. So do we have seasonal fluctuations? Do we have differences in the time of day that images are being acquired? For example, if you want to use MODIS and you want to get the most frequently available MODIS data that you can, MODIS is on two different satellites. One, one has the morning overpass and, and one the afternoon overpass, so Terra versus Aqua. Okay, and you'll see different things in the morning and afternoon. And maybe that's what you want, maybe it's not. 
it doesn't matter. What's, what's important is understanding what your requirements are and how that relates to the sensors or satellites that you're using and what effect that's going to have on your data. So a couple of quick examples of some multi-temporal analysis products. Right, this one is a, a simple post-classification change detection. All right, so this is an area just off Brisbane in Moreton Bay and looking at Lingia, Lingbia, which is an algal bloom. Okay. So, and this, this first one, the, the Lingbia areas have been classified into high, medium and low density areas. Okay, this is date one for June um, 2002 and in July 2002, the exact same classification, so high, medium and low areas. Okay, so still categorical, even though that's in some, some form of order. Okay, then what we can do is work out what happens from date one to date two. Okay, and have you, has it gone from medium to high, from low to medium, low to high, for example. Okay, doesn't give you any indication of what happens in between these dates. Okay, it's just a start stop. Okay. And also doesn't give you any indication as to the reason why this change has occurred. So that's a really good question. How do you deal with the tidal changes between these images? And that's, that is part of that temporal consideration. So ideally what you do is you try and find the same tide. Okay, if you're dealing with Landsat data, that is going to be next to impossible. Um, you just have to be really, really lucky. If you're working with MODIS or something that comes over more frequently, you have that flexibility. Landsat, it's tough. For 16 days, you, you ought to be lucky to get that cloud free, the right tide, everything falling into place. So you're pretty close to Buckley's to get it. Um, the other option that you can do um, for, for looking at differences, say, say if you're looking more at submerged features, this is less of a problem for Lingbia, um, but if you're looking at submerged features like seagrasses and coral, and you do have those tidal differences, but you've got the option to correct for the water column. So there's some algorithms to use to try and cut the water column out, just as we try and cut the atmosphere out as well. Okay. This is a, a time series animation made from MODIS images, looking at burnt areas. Okay, so nice for you guys up the back looking at this particular question. So just across the top end, and what you can see with this one is that these images have been acquired twice daily. And you can see most of the area getting burnt as time passes. There is a, a small date clicker here that I imagine that's difficult to see from the back, but you just see the, the days passing over. So this has got the, all the data stacked up, okay? So the original images have been classified just simply into burnt versus not burnt. And as the, as the time passes, the later in the year, the the colours will also change, okay? So it's, you're, you're adding in that extra dimension of giving an attribute to, to the month when something was burnt. So if something gets burnt early in the year, January, it's a dark green, and then as you pass all the way through the year, through to December, you get a red colour. Okay, so you're getting a couple things there, not just, not just what gets burnt and unburnt, but the time of year that it's burnt as well. And this one's quite cool because you'll actually see that the, that the later you go into the dry season, the size of those patches gets considerably larger as well, just as the fuel loads get higher too. So this is a different form. This is looking at a quantitative product and quite simply a getting one image and s subtracting the values in a pixel to another, okay? And this has used a, a uh, uh, the NDVI, so a vegetation index, and understanding that what, that what the value within a pixel with respect to the vegetation index is, is giving you an indication about the level of vegetation that's there. Okay? Each pixel has a particular value in date one versus date two, and you subtract that numerical value. Okay? And if the value goes down, then you've got a vegetation loss. But if that NDVI goes up, then there's a vegetation gain, okay? So it's different to that categorical classification. There's no classification to start with. It's just looking purely at those pixel values. Um, this also is looking purely at pixel values, this time in temperature. Okay, so this is Mount Ruapehu in the central North Island of New Zealand. Um, this is the top of the volcano here. 
So you just see all, uh, this has got a crater lake just at the top there. Um, and in the temperature image, you can just see that that lake is, is warmer than the surrounds. There's actually snow at the top of the time that this, um, this average image, image was created. Okay, so the idea, was, the idea here is to look at how the temperature of the lake varies over, the, over time to see if that, if that can give an indication about uh, volcanic activity. Um, so if we look at that stretched out, um, dates along the x-axis and individual images or just, just the crater lake part of those images um, where those, um, at those acquisition dates. Um, and the temperature in the colour scheme at the top. Okay, you can also plot this out as a graph. Okay, so you can see that the lake was relatively cool in these dates um, and then was getting warmer and sort of stabilised across the top and you can see that in the pixel values there as well. Um, incidentally, there was, um, there was an eruption um, just about there and that's when the temperature went up shortly afterwards. The final example I've got for you guys is can be actually relatively difficult to understand but all that it is is instead of putting the spectral bands of one sensor into your multi-band display like we're doing in the practical class what you can put put in each of those each of your color guns is a different date okay so for example in this modus image here the red color gun is related to the green band of february 2010 image the green color is related to October 2009 and the blue colour is about June 2009. Okay, so if there was no change at all in the environment, you would not see any colour variation across your, across your image. Okay, so those colour variations that you see are based on the brightness values in one of these dates changing, one or, um, one or two of the dates changing. Okay, and as they change, that affects the colour that you see on the display. So it's a really rapid way of saying, oh, okay, all right, these, these areas here that are sort of pinkish, what does that mean? Okay, well, here's my red colour gun, February 2010. So the, that date meant that there was a brighter value coming through than the other dates. So that might be tidal changes, it might also be sedimentation. You can see the same up in the area up there as well.